sorry, my mom. Wow. Um, she has 25 years of um, activism work. She spent 16 years owning her own CPA business in one of the smallest towns ever. But most importantly, she spent 14 years being the best mom I could ever have. And I, <laughs> um, I always come along with her on this campaign trail because, you know, um, if I didn't, I wouldn't have a lot of time with her. But also, it, it, so it got me a lot closer with her, but it's also taught me so much. And it's really put her in a new view because um, I've always seen her as the loud like loud spoken, always putting herself out there. But this really solidified that because like Colin said, she saw the problems and she's trying to get it done. And that's who my mom is. Good morning. Good morning. Wow. I didn't even know she was coming with me until last night. She didn't even know she was going to speak until a few seconds ago upstairs. And for her to get up and do that, oh, I'm, I'm proud. I'm, 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 I'm impressed. Thank you, darling. Uh, thank you all for having me. When Colin asked me to speak on the issue of justice, I put it off for a long time. I just graduated from Leadership Nashville, and justice, criminal justice, this was the hardest one for me. It was very emotional, because it's, it's very deep. And so I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to think about it. Plus, hey, I've been busy campaigning too. So last night I was thinking, how am I going to address this issue with this crowd? Do I even want to go there? So I decided, you know what? I'm going to do it anyway, <laughs> for a number of reasons. One. That young lady right there. She got up here a couple of months back, and she spoke, and she was brave. And I was like, after what she did, I can't be scared. I got to be here, too. The second thing is calling. You can't say no to him, even if you want to. I mean, I learned that after meeting him that, eh, it doesn't matter. You're going to do it anyway. The third reason is, well, look at all the votes in this room. <laughs> I'm a politician after all. <laughs> so that's a good motivation to come and speak. And so we're going to tackle justice. Like I said, it's very broad. And I want you to, to uh, lower your expectation because I really want to do very well. And so now that I've told you that it's not a topic that I'm very big on, I'm not an attorney, and I'm, I'm tired campaigning. Do you see me giving you all the excuses? So lower it, that way I can do very well, all right? So the perspective that I want to share with you is mine. I'm going to look at it through my own lens, what justice means to me. And hopefully I can inspire you to do the same and look at it from your own angle. And then apply it. That's what I'm hoping I can do. And I thought there was two things that I want to do mainly with it. I want to look into justice and action. What is justice? What is the framework that I look at justice through? But more than anything, as someone who is an activist, we cannot have justice unless we have action. And that action is you and I, is everybody. And I'm hoping that we find a way to use our voices, our passion, our different lenses to take action for justice. And when we do that, Actually, the word that I first came up with was a marriage. And my son said, don't use marriage, so we're using union. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what the difference is, but we're going to have a marriage, we're going to have a union for a better society. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to paint a mental framework that is based again on my lens. But I want you to follow with me because I think that's what we all should do. Looking at it from my own uh, 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 angle. I want you to take a minute to look at this picture. 
and think about it for a second. Oftentimes, a lot of us get riled up when we see something that mirrored the first picture. A lot of us feel, oh my God, how come that third child cannot even see? We all feel something needs to be done, and we all jump up and we feel we need to do that, and that's correct. Then take a look at the second picture. That is when, as a society or as people, we make sure there's equity. Everybody gets what they need. And now everybody can see through the fence. But what I'm trying to do today is get us to the third picture. Because oftentimes, we all stop at the second one, and we think the work is done. Ah, we can see now. The third picture provokes us to look at ways to actually remove barriers, to look at ways to make it more just, to look at ways to make sure we don't even get there in the first place. Why do we even have to when you talk about criminal justice system? How do we even make sure that the kids don't even get there in the first place? And that's, that's what I think when I think about justice, the preventive side. They're making sure that we actually remove the barriers. And I'm hoping that at the end of the day, that's what we all look at and how to get there. So justice has to be balanced. We have to look at it that more than punitive. Oftentimes when we're talking justice, we always talk about people paying the price for what they did. But what is that price? When does that stop? When does it start? When is it enough? We need to look at the principle of mercies and opportunities. I saw a young man uh, uh, about a week ago. I was in East Nashville with a friend. And my friend was saying, vote for Z. She's running for cancer at large. And the dude told me, I would love to vote for you, but I cannot vote because of something that I did when I was young. Do people pay for it for the rest of their lives? Do we look at barriers that make it impossible for people to get back into society? Think about it. When is it really done? And what does that mean? Justice has to be holistic. It cannot be one, you cannot paint everybody with the same brush, right? You have to look at the root cause. How did we get here? If A and B does the same thing, do they get the same ju judgment or the same punishment? Did we look at how A got here and how B got here? That has to be factored in. Because when it's not, to me that's in itself is an injustice. It has to be preventive. My uh, Third child, who is a medical student at Ohio State, I spoke to him and he, he put the final slides together for me this morning. And so he was thinking preventative medicine. And so when I got it, I was like, that's a medical term. I, I mean preventive. So it's not preventative. I don't even know if that's a word other than, other than in the medical field. So I don't know. But it's preventive. Justice has to be preventive. When kids don't have the resources that they need, is that even just? We talk about schools and arts. Kids not being able to express themselves correctly. We, we're cutting funding for arts in our schools, right? And without giving them that opportunity to be able to express themselves, can we really punish them when they act out? Just thinking. It has to be prevented. Because when it's not, and we don't have the same opportunities, then it's not justice. Justice has to be demanded. It has to be demanded. Because oftentimes, it doesn't work the way that we say it. And that's where we all come in. That's the action part. That's when we see that it's not balanced. That's when we see it's not holistic. That's when it's not preventive. That's when we speak up to say, what can I do? For me, it's rallies. For me, 
is being an agitator. For me, it's being an advocate. And when all of that did not work, hey, it's running for office. What is it for you? How do we make sure that when we see this imbalance, how do we act? So that's the framework that I look at justice through. And so you all take a minute and look at that in your personal lives. And when you see a situation, apply those principles in looking at it. And then once you do that, and the next thing is you demand it. You demand it. You demand it. And that's where the action comes in. Understanding action. And that's the quotes, one of my favorite one, from Desmond Tutu. We cannot, we must not be neutral in the case of injustice. We cannot. Because when we do, we're actually taking the position of the oppressor. We're siding with the oppressor, whether we say it or not. Therefore, acting in whatever way that we can, it's an obligation that we have. And I'm not reading the whole thing because I know you're going to get it later. Action is not optional. That's the first thing. It's not optional. Sometimes we think it is. When something is not impacting us directly, we all turn a blind eye. Think about them kids at the border in the cages. Eh? Why did their parents come here? Maybe if they didn't come here, it wouldn't happen. That's something the federal government has to do, right? No. That's something that we all can do. Action is multidirectional, and we use by for now. And the, word, the reason why I said that is oftentimes, for those of us that are actually activists and wants to act and we see an injustice, we call out the oppressor. We have picket lines, we write, we do, we do this, we do that, and that's very good. What I don't see happening, we forget the victims. Our action should also include what are we doing for the people that are oppressed. And maybe that's where the creative community comes in. We loudmouths will hold the picket fences. We can hold the sign, I can write anything. I cannot draw nothing, nothing, Jack. I can't even draw a stick person, okay? And when I take pictures, I can't even take pictures by myself. I can't even have a good picture of me being taken. So don't even tell me to take a picture of you, okay? <laughs> right? But what about us providing songs that suit the kids? What about us writing opiate about the injustice we're seeing? from the victim's perspective. What about the plays? That's where we can all, because the people going through it, yes, they love that you're standing up for them, but that does not mean that what they're going through is gone away. That's trauma. And so justice, action, to me has to be multi-directional, to be completely effective. Because if you don't tackle it from both ends, you might solve one problem, but you're creating another. Justice has to be consistent. And I said that for two reasons. One, when we hear about an issue, we all get fired up. We all get fired up, we want to do something about it. Then we get our Facebook posts, we get our Twitter posts, we take a picture, and then we're done. And then we're done. But the issue is not. So we have to be persistent. We have to stay the course until the issue is resolved. Otherwise, our action is just a photo op. It's just something to make us feel better about ourselves. So we can check the box that we did something. I posted it on Facebook. Hey. It has to be more than that. If you think writing about it is what it takes, then write about it until it's done. If it's taking picture, take different series of the different stages. That's the persistent. The other part of the consistency is that we cannot pick and choose when we do take action. 
For me as a Muslim, I should get equally irate. I should get equally mad whether the issue is about a Muslim or it's about a Christian, an atheist. It's about a human being. My level of passion should be the same. It should not be that because this is my friend, then I say something. Well, then it's about Zofa, who cares? Nobody understands what she's saying anyway. Right? We have to be consistent. Our action has to be consistent. And that's the only way to make it work. So, we have a framework. We have a definition. We have what the action should be. And I want us to take us through a couple of steps on how we can put that together. I'm looking at a case where kids are not performing well. My daughter went to a school that did not have enough computers. People that have been on the trail with me know this story. It's one of the reasons why I decided to run for office. We have a school that did not have enough computers. They have a computer going from one, on a cart, going from one class to the other. So when this class have it, this class may not have it. The school is located in North Nashville, right behind Maxwell House. 37208, the zip code with the highest incarceration rate in the entire country. So you can assume these kids don't have computers at home. To make things worse, we have a whole district in Nashville, District 3, that does not have a public library. So we're failing our kids, right? In the same school, I went there, I was a principal for a day, and I saw a child that has a dirty uniform. So what I'm saying is this. The kids does not have the computer, the teachers are doing three, four jobs, can't handle everything going on in the classroom. The kids start to act up, right? We put them in detention. The next thing you know, the kids drop out of school. Then that kids get into trouble. You see the cycle? It's a little thing. So as small as take out computers, put art classes, put any resources, the funding of the school, that's an injustice. That's the preventive side that we're not taking care of. That's something that can balloon into us having to deal with it on the criminal side. So that's an example. So what we can do as an action, you can contact your school board or city officials or council members, and you may know one if you all vote for me. <laughs> Put it in a plug, wink, wink. <laughs> and I'm already passionate about the issue. Ha! So you won't have to tell me. <laughs> Start a nonprofit. Volunteer in the school. They don't have an art teacher. Maybe you do art on the weekend with the kids. What about that not being able to express themselves? What if we have a, 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 a weekend class to teach children? how to put their words, their feelings into words. How about we donate computers? Those are actions. And those are actions that's going to impact, that's going to correct the injustice, right, that is happening in the school, but it's also going to help down the road. I go back to that child that came in when I was a principal for a day with a dirty uniform. It was so self-conscious. It was just so sad. And after some time, the principal took him aside, and the real principal, not me, took him aside and talked to him. And then we find out what the issue was. So John Early has a closet that has clean uniforms for kids to pick from sanitary towels. Because these kids are dealing with a lot of adverse childhood experiences. A lot of social emotional issues that is impacting out the study. And if we don't address that, then we're just putting bandage on the issues. Because such a child, how do you, that child is, if, we did, if he did not get a clean uniform, will be sad all day. Then the teacher is going to ask Billy to do something, and Billy is not going to want to do it. Because Billy doesn't want his classmate to see his, his uniform. Then Billy will be sent out of the classroom because he was not listening. And the cycle continues. Same thing with ADHD. I have to talk to my kids' teacher and say, look, my kids are gifted, so you have to keep them engaged. Find extra homework for them to do 
so that when they finish what you give them, they will not take over your classroom. Because if you don't, they're going to be bored. And then they start acting up. And then you say they got ADHD. Then you got to put them in medicine. Then you got to put them in timeout. And if you're a kid, think about it. You go to timeout once or twice, then you don't like school. You don't want to go to school. Then what happens? You drop out. Then what happens? See where we are? And so that's something that we can do. That's an injustice that is within the system. And what action can we take? We can educate our faculties on restorative school practice. We can advocate to have social workers and psychologists in the school. Our teachers are being, they're teaching math. They're also dealing with social issues. And we're not even paying them enough. Oh, sound like a campaign pitch. Okay, let's turn that one down. Yeah, that sounds like a campaign pitch, right? But it's part of it. It's an action that we can take. The third thing is, let's work with the youth in our community. This is a group that can do a lot, and I see you all as one that can take these serious issues and use your talent to help us diffuse it. There's so many uh, um, examples that we can go by. My passion has always been education. My passion has always been about children, right? And I always feel, feel like what you put in them is what you get back out. If we don't take the time to do what we need to do on the front end, we as society will pay for it on the back end. And that's why for me, education has always been something that I, that I so I'm, I'm, I'm saying that we all can do something once we understand it, once we know what to do. So I want, I'm gonna end with this with you. This is a verse from the Quran as a Muslim. This is where my passion comes from. This is where my motivation comes from. It says, oh you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, be witnesses for God, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. Whether one is rich or poor, God is more worthy of both. So follow not personal inclination, lest you not be just. And if you distort your testimony or refuse to give it, then indeed God is ever with what you do acquainted. That sums it up for me. Standing up for social justice is not optional for me. Being fair is not optional for me. Making sure that I'm consistent in who I stand up for, issues that I stand up for, is not optional for me. Because I believe that is something we all have to do. And think about it. It may not affect you today. It might be another group. But tomorrow it could be you. You all have heard the saying about when they came for the Jews, I did not speak up, and they gave for the... You remember that thing? And then one day they came for me, and there was nobody to stand for me, right? That's basically what I'm saying. So, here's the charge. It's a serious topic. We all can look at it from different lenses. But it's one that we all must, that we have a moral obligation to look at. We must understand the framework, and then we must put it to action. The Quran is my motivation. You all need to find what your motivation is. But you must find it. We must do something. It's not something that we can afford to not do something about. So my charge to all of you, find your motivation. Understand the framework. And by God, do act. Thank you very much.